attempts to represent geometrical objects in perspective. We come to here, but it doesn't even take a very uh, careful look to see that the, although that's a hexagon, and it's sort of tried to be in perspective, if we fit a perfect perspective corrected hexagon to it, it doesn't fit. The Jan van Eyck chandelier. Well, let me magnify this. That chandelier, I want to remind you, that screen is, I don't know, 15 feet across. That chandelier, if I went to the National Gallery and the guards let me do this, I can cover the, that entire chandelier with my cupped hand. So I've taken something that's this big, blown it up to 15 feet across, and it maintains its incredible fidelity. How did Van Eyck do that? And I'm going to tell you how he did it. Let's see if it's in perfect perspective. So what we'll do is we'll fit a perfect, idealized, computer-generated chandelier to it and see how well it fits. Well, at first glance, it fits extremely well. If you look a little more carefully, you see, well, it's off by a little bit here, by a couple of millimeters. But as I'm going to show you, that is going to be evidence that optics was used. Because there are ways to generate by uh, just the laws of perspective, which had not been developed then, to do something in perfect perspective. But there's no way you can project a handmade 15th century chandelier. It can't have the, the fidelity of a perfect uh, object. And we're going to talk about that. Well. The question is, did they have the technology at the time? I've already shown you that they had the spectacles at the time. I'm going to argue that they used concave mirrors early on. If we look, here's this catalog of medieval and Renaissance books, textbooks on optics. There were 65 treatises on optics. Written in a, it's a critical period, actually. There's an Arab scientist I'll mention in a little bit, Ibn al-Haytham, 1000, up to the time of Van Eyck. One new textbook in geometrical optics is written every seven years. There aren't that many new textbooks in optics written today. So if you would have asked me, I don't know, 10 years ago, what was going on in medieval times, I would have you know, explained to you the Cro-Magnons were fighting the dinosaurs. Really, nothing's going on. It turns out it was a period of intense intellectual activity. One problem was that the people back then were not very intelligent. They couldn't write in English. But so some of these texts, though, have been translated, not very many, been translated into modern European languages, and they describe exactly how to make a concave mirror by polishing out of metal in the grinding paste and it takes to do that. And I've made these mirrors. Well, for you New Yorkers, that's called a cactus. So what I'm going to do is, with my handmade mirror that I made myself out of, well, in this case with aluminum, but I like brass better now, that I made in one hour. I made a mirror that I can project this backyard scene, the individual, on some projectors it's easier to see on others, the wrought iron fence, we can see the wrought iron fence here, that gives me an angular resolution, I can tell you how good my mirror is. My mirror is approximately three times better than Van Eyck would have needed to, to use for any of his paintings. For those of you who are scientists though, it's 2,000 times worse than the Hubble Space Telescope. So, where we think as scientists it takes really great optics to do something, to, to polish something, to project an image. No, in fact, it doesn't. And to see how bad you can do, I bought from a wholesale restaurant supply company in Tucson a stamped stainless steel, made in Korea, spot welded, with holes in it, ladle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to project the scene of outside my lab from the 10th floor, and I've got a photograph of what the lab is. You can't simultaneously see the projected scene and the... Um, the direct scene, so you just have to compare the two, and we'll see. I mean, a scientist would say you could never project an image with that unless you tried it. Now, it's not the world's greatest image, but it shows you how awful your optics can be. That image is certainly good enough for a clever person to have developed the laws of geometrical perspective, for Brunelleschi, just seeing that scene alone. One of the good things about being involved with somebody as famous as David Hockney is people have contacted me with useful information. Some of the bad things are people pick it, um, call at 3 a.m. to denounce me. There is this strange stuff goes on. Um, you guys are interested in art, or sometimes you're a little too passionate. Um, 
This was one of the good ones. He called, he, he emailed me and said, you're easier to find than Hockney. Um, are you aware of the discussion of mirrors in the Romance of the Rose? Well, I confess I'd never heard of the Romance of the Rose. But it turns out the Barnes & Noble bookstore in Tucson, Arizona, had two copies on the shelf. Now, if you're familiar with publishing world, you know the books go out of print like five minutes after they're published, because, just because of the tax laws. The fact that there are two copies of this book written 600 years ago on the shelf tells you it's widely used today in the humanities. And what the translator says, it was the most widely read work of the French language. And unlike me, presumably Jan van Eyck, who worked in the court of Burgundy, spoke French. There are four pages that discuss the properties of, of mirrors. You're, you're not able to read that, but if I magnify certain sections, it describes Ella Zane um, wrote about the properties of mirrors. That's Ibn al-Haytham, whose seminal textbook, seven-volume textbook, on, in fact, describes our modern uh, understanding of vision and perception and optics today. His book was translated into Latin at this time and had it was widely um, um, influential, including places like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Ella Zane is discussed in there. And the, the poet says that I'm not going to take the trouble to clarify the shapes of mirrors, how rays are reflected, or describe their angles. I'm not an expert in French epic poetry of the medieval period, but this strikes me as awfully technical language for a French epic poem. If we magnify one of the pages, to, I'll skip over some of this in the interest of, of getting us done on time today. Certain mirrors make phantoms appear quite alive outside the mirror, either in water or in air. It's not like water and air rhyme in French. That's not why you use those words. Water and air were of great interest to the philosophers of the time. Um, a solid, light doesn't go through. Air, light goes forever. Water is sort of funny. It's in between. In some ways, it has the properties of a transparent sub substance. Other times, it has properties of an opaque substance. Before we'd ever heard of the Romance of the Rose, the BBC filmed us, and one of the things in, in the film is David Hockney is describing this projected image of a cabbage. It's upside down. We already know that all projected images are upside down. I want you to compare how a 21st century artist describes this scene with how it's described in the Romance of the Rose. And I realized this is a color movie. It moves. I mean, there it is. It's spinning. It's quite beautiful. Of course, it's upside down. The string's coming from the bottom. And I then realized, my God, this is a, this is a movie in color. They must have seen it 600 years ago. Well, he was wrong. They saw it 700 years ago. So. Up to this point, I've shown you that they had the technology to make the optics necessary to project images. They understood how to project images. It remains for me, though, to convince you that artists actually did project images and make use of the projected images in their artwork. And so for this, I have to teach you optics. And it's dangerous. It's comfortable chairs, dark room. Pay attention, though. This is the part where you really have to know what I'm going to show you in order to evaluate the evidence. Well, one thing we've all been taught is that parallel lines all lead to a vanishing point. No one bothers telling you, though, that objects that are right along the same railroad tracks but slightly deviating from being along the same lines, they're deviations from uh, perfection. So if we come across a painting like this and we draw, this is too good to be true. There's no way I've been to Italy. No way do the Italians construct the facade of that building exactly parallel to the facade of this building. <laughs> you know that. So we can be reasonably sure, because of the degree of perfection, that this painting, made after the laws of perspective have been developed, that this painting was done um, not with optics, but was been done with the laws of, of um, perspective. 